Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, this is our spoken history program and we're gonna be having people inside the library here in the Felker room and others joining us online. And for those friends who are joining online, you're going to be able to ask questions um, in the chat and then I'll be able to relay them to our speaker tonight. Um, Spoken History is a, co a collaborative effort of the Northwood County Historical Society, the Marshfield Historic Preservation Association, the City of Marshfield Historic Preservation Committee, the Marshfield Genealogy Group, and the Re Everett Rail Marshfield Public Library. My name is Natalie Cruz, and I work here at the Marshfield Public Library. Our speaker tonight is Mr. Don Schnitzler, that you're always, you're probably going to be pretty familiar with. He's a local historian here who's had uh, many presentations, and we always enjoy um, the information that he gives us. And the topic tonight is the history rising from the grave, the organization, growth, and care of Marshfield's, Marshfield's cemeteries on the hill. Um, but before we begin, I'm going to read a um, definition of a cemetery what a cemetery is um, by George Shepard. This is a cemetery. Lives are commemorated, deaths are recorded, families are re reunited, memories are made tangible, and love is undis undisguised. This is a cemetery. Communities accord respect, families bestow reverence, historians seek information, and our heritage is thereby enriched. Testimonies of devotion, pride, and remembrance are cast in bronze to pay warm tribute to accomplishments and to the life, not the death of a loved one's of, lo of a loved one. The cemetery is homeland for memorials that are a sustaining source of comfort to the living. A cemetery is a history of people, a perpetual record of yesterday, and a sanctuary of peace and quiet of today. A cemetery exists because life is worth loving and remembering always. Take Very it away, cool. Don. Yep. How do I follow that? <laughs> I'm going to sit so I can see my screen. Um, and let's see. I guess the easy play, best place to start here is to kind of explain why I even talked about or thought about doing a talk on the history of the cemetery. Uh, I grew up in Marshfield, and for years, I just knew that the cemetery was up at the top of the hill. And it wasn't until I started thinking about the question, why was it up on the top of the hill? If you go to Hewitt or Roselleville, the cemeteries are right next to the churches. But in Marshfield, there's no place where a cemetery is next to the church. And so I started questioning, what caused the people in Marshfield to decide to put the cemetery out of town, up on a hill, away from everything. And that's kind of where this talk started from. And as we go through tonight, I'll try to explain what I think happened and why it's there. Um, I will also, uh, let's see, there we go. I will also kind of put a caveat here is, as I'm talking, I don't want to talk about ghost stories. This isn't about scary stuff. This is about the people that lived in Marshfield and the community that really is still up on top of the hill um, in Marshfield. And while it's a history, I wanna make sure people know it's not a comprehensive history because what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pick a couple things and talk about them as examples. Um, so that's the second thing, it's not comprehensive. And the history of the cemetery goes back to the 1880s if we tried to cover the whole thing, 1880 to 2020, we'd be here tomorrow morning yet talking. And so I, I tried to cut it off at 1920. And then before I sent the PowerPoint to, to, to the library so they could load it up on the program here, I thought, oh, I gotta stick this in there. So there's a little bit of a, 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 a fudge there, but for the most part, I'm gonna focus on the first 40 years of the history of the cemetery. Uh, and then, Again, we'll share some ex explanations about why I think the cemetery is where it's at and talk about how you can use the cemetery for sharing history. And we do a great job of that with the school kids uh, the Friday before Memorial Day every year. Uh, but there's also lots of opportunities that we could still put in place uh, to share more history because there's some great stories 
hate to hate, hate to say this buried there, but but they are. There's some wonderful stories about people uh, and events and things that happen to them in their lives that are waiting to be unearthed. <laughs> Enough of those. <laughs> so first thing, one of the distinctions I think is important when we talk about the cemetery here in Marshfield is to realize that we have a dedicated space, a space that's specifically set aside for the burial ground. It, and it's not associated with the church. There's churches that own it, but it's separate from the church. When you go to the Rosalvo and Hewitt and you see the churches next to the cemeteries, uh, those are graveyards. They're buried on the church grounds. Uh, Marshfield doesn't have that. The idea was to create a special place for the burial of Marshfield's dead. And there's lots of reasons why they would do it that way. And we can talk about those in a second. But when you look at this map, and I should have brought my pointer and I didn't, um, can you guys, can you see my uh, pointer on the screen? Uh, it's, yeah. Okay. If you look at Marshfield, the center of Marshfield is kind of like a crosshair right in the middle of this. This is this would be the railroad tracks going through town here, and then uh, Central Avenue runs north and south here. The location of the cemetery actually isn't even on this map from 1883 of Marshfield. It's it's located way down on the bottom over by where the the uh, seal would be in the lower right hand corner of the picture. So when they created the cemetery or first started to use the cemetery as a burial site, they put it so far out in the community that it wasn't even on the maps that were being drawn of the community. So why? Why is the big question? Here's a not current picture of where the cemetery is located, but if you look at the junction of Highway 97 and 13, that's about where the boulevard meets Highway 97 and goes north. The cemetery is up on the top where that red arrow is. Um, when the cemetery was first established at that location, there were no roads. So when it came to going to bury the dead, there were no roads to the cemetery. So why put it there instead of someplace where they could have easy access? It, it, it was always perplexing to me when I was younger, thinking about the cemetery. Why did they do it that way? So one of the things, one of the reasons, and I think this is actually the reason why the cemetery is located where it is, is in the mid 1850s, there was a movement called the Rural Cemetery Movement. And big towns wanted to have their dead buried outside of the populated centers of the town so that there was, if, if there was a risk of disease being contagious, it was located away from the townspeople. And so Boston, Philadelphia, the, all the big cities started to establish cemeteries away from the town. And even in Wisconsin, 1858, Forest Hill Cemetery was set up in Madison on much the same um, plan. Now, while I can't find any documentation in Marshfield newspapers, there's nobody left notes to say schnitz, this is what, why we put the cemetery there. Uh, I do think that it's located where it is because it was part of the rural cemetery movement. And the, and the idea with the rural cemetery movement was that they typically established the cemetery out of the outskirts of town on a high hill. Well, think about where our cemetery is. That's the highest point, highest elevation in the city of Marshfield between McMillan and Upham Street there. Um, so that would make perfect sense for that to be the location they would choose. Now, why they didn't go on the north side of Upham Street rather than the south side of Upham? because that's where it's really the highest, I don't know. But for some reason, they picked that high point in the city of Marshfield to establish uh, our original cemetery. Um, and I, this is, you know, really, um, oh, I can't think of the word I wanna use, soft criteria. But until 1903, the city's cemetery and park committee actually oversaw the location of the park and the care of the park. So again, the idea of it being a park-like setting that they were creating at a distance from the town kind of falls into that rural cemetery movement yet. 
Now, one of the things that was common with the rural cemetery movement was fences. A lot of the cemeteries were very well decorated, very well fixed up. And then they had fences at the borders to set them off from the rest of the area. Well, if you go through the Marshfield paper in 1883, they're petitioning to clear the cemetery and actually fence it in. And that fencing is there for the next almost 30 years. It's sitting or wrapped around the cemetery. So again, that fits the idea of a rural cemetery movement to have a fenced in uh, cemetery area. I also think it's important that one of the problems we have here in Marshfield with tracking the cemetery history is uh, we don't have a lot of photographs. And so you would think that something that was in place for 30 years, somebody would have captured an image of it. There's lots of pictures of the hospital. Why couldn't they have just turned around and took a picture of the other side of the street? So one of the things I wanted to do, and as people watch this, I wanted to emphasize if you have photographs of the cemetery, and every family takes different pictures of different things, but if you were to take pictures of the cemetery or find pictures of the cemetery in your family collections, uh, consider making a donation or a loan of those to the historical society so they can copy them and give you back the originals just to help document the history of the cemetery. Um, the other thing that you think about with rural cemetery movement is this idea of park-like setting. And if you go up and look at the oldest section of the cemetery, uh, this is a picture just taken looking at what would have been the original main entrance to the cemetery. It's no longer the main entrance to the cemetery. It's looking kind of on a western, a slight southwestern look. And the reason it's lined up that way is because when they planted the trees, they line them up in such a way that if you stand in a certain spot, it's kind of like going to a military cemetery where the trees line up in very orderly rows. And you can kind of see that there's, there's this path going through this set of trees here. And that whole front of the cemetery, depending on where you stand, you could actually make that visible. Um, Trees, you know, I look at the cemetery, the old section of cemetery to me is beautiful. I mean, with all those big trees in there, and yet I know when I drove by there's, there this winter after the uh, heavy snow that we got and all the branches were down and the trees were down. I went through there today. You could see where there were stumps that they had cut down trees because of it. It's beautiful, but it's also a chore for the cemetery crew to take care of and keep clean. I'm kind of pleased that being here today, I can look at that and remember or think about that's the way the cemetery looks. 50 years from now, I'm not sure how many of those trees will be there because every year they lose a few. And because of the care and uptake, they don't replant trees when they come down. So I expect the front of our cemetery, that, that first part of the municipal cemetery will change over the next 50 years or so. Um, one of the things, this, this goes along with the trees. This is a quote from a magazine called The Country Gentleman in 1857, that cemeteries are not to be left naked and desolate, uh, as were most old fashioned burying yards. We conclude that the cemetery should be a pleasant cultivated scene. And when you think about the cemeteries, this idea of these park-like settings was really to invite people into the cemetery to, uh, visit their families, have picnics in the park or picnics in the cemetery. Uh, and so the trees and the other things that were planted in the cemetery helped establish that kind of atmosphere that would have been good for family gatherings. Now, one of the things that I thought was interesting when I started looking at this is when did we get ownership of that land? And we'll, we'll talk about when people were buried there in a minute, but as far as the ownership of the land, we don't really start acquiring ownership of the land, in this case, the city, from until 1986. There were people being buried there in the 1870s and 1880s. There had to be some arrangement with the town uh, for ownership, and because we purchased some of it or, or settled things up between the township too, to acquire the land. But official ownership of most of the land in the cemetery between the city uh, and the original owners uh, didn't start until the 1880s, mid 1880s. 
and yet it was being used as a cemetery before that. So one of the things I wanted to kind of just mention is that there was a, a, a land grant given to the Fox and Wisconsin Improvement Company. The idea was they wanted to create a channel or a canal between the Fox and Wisconsin River out to the Mississippi so that they could move um, transport things from the east part of the state to the west part of the state. And in 1856, they established this land grant. Erastus Corning, who was one of the owners of that or investors in that company, um, became the sole property owner for that section up on the top of the hill in 1866. He died six years later, so he we didn't really have any transactions with him. Uh, but that land was in the Corning family when the city started to bury people there and make acquisitions of it. So when the sale was finally approved, uh, it was recorded at the courthouse 1887, uh, there was a little bit of back taxes that had to be paid on it. And so there was negotiation on exactly how that settlement was going to be made. This is Erastus Corning. And again, he was a stockholder in the Fox and Wisconsin Improvement Company. There was another company called the Green Bay and Mississippi Canal Company, which was kind of the, uh, the company that followed the other one. And again, when uh, the company was kind of falling apart or being reorganized, the different stockholders took different portions of the land as their payment for um, investments. And in his case, he had 62,000 acres of land in Wisconsin. Samuel Marsh, who is one of the principal landowners of the rest of the area of Marshfield at the time, also received approximately the same amount of acreage. But his land was down in this area, and Mr. Corning's was up on the hill. Like Samuel Marsh, both of the gentlemen died in, 19, or in 1872. So I don't know that either of them were ever here in town. It was their heirs that really established the sales connected to the city. And for Erastus Corning, his son was Erastus Jr. Uh, and Erastus was married to Mary Parker. And uh, it was their name, or it is their name, that appears on the sale of the land from the Corning family to the city or the township. Um, regarding the cemetery land. And one of the things I think may just be a coincidence, but again, going back to this idea that our cemetery is actually an example of the rural cemetery movement, is that he was the president of the Albany Rural Cemetery Movement. And so it may be that it was a coincidence and it may be that he knew enough about that land to think that if they're gonna use it for a cemetery, uh, we'll give him a good deal on it. And believe me, he for what that land is worth today, it was a good deal. So um, there are some other land transactions that happen. Once the land comes into the city or the town's possession, it, it goes back and forth between the Lutheran, Lutheran uh, Cemetery, the Catholic Cemetery, and then people from around in this community. So St. John the Baptist acquired part of the land from the town of Marshfield in 1886. Uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, Emmanuel Lutheran, um, in 1888. And then years later, uh, when the Bubals family was selling their farm, the city purchased a large tract of land from them and then immediately sold half of it to the Catholic cemetery. And much of their land is still up there uh, available to be used for burial spaces. When it comes to the land transactions that are reported in the newspaper, uh, 1884, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, the Emanuel Lutheran Church, uh, asked the city for some of this land. Same thing happened to the Catholic Church. Once the city had acquired the land, they came and asked to have that portion where they were burying their parishioners to, bear, to have ownership of that land. And so you see quit claims deeds in 84 and 85 to the different churches. And then after Marshfield formally organized as a city in 1883, 
uh, the city made negotiations or negotiated the settlement of ownership of that land, took it from the town of Mc, town of Marshfield, uh, so it became property of the city, and that was done in 1886. So there's lots of land transactions that are going in. What I think is interesting is that the first burials were going on in 1879 and 1880. We don't own that land. So now I mentioned I was going to talk a little bit about, uh, I put a couple extra slides in that are a little bit later. Before I get to those, and they have to do with the Catholic cemetery, um, I can find nothing, you know, as far as a dedication of uh, the municipal cemetery. It was like they were there. It was they were working on it. Well, there was never a celebration or anything dedicating the space as a municipal cemetery. The Catholics, on the other hand, three days after the Great Marshfield Fire, had a thousand people up there for a dedication ceremony for the Catholic cemetery. Which the the coincidence of the date I think is uh, pretty surprising because I would have thought that nobody was going to be gathering together for a picnic-like celebration up on the hill. They, there was too much other stuff to do. But that June 30th, uh, the First Communion was celebrated at the church. There were 60 kids that had First Communion. And then in the afternoon, they went up to the cemetery and dedicated the Catholic portion of the cemetery um, with visiting priests from outside of town. And a thousand people gathering in one place in Marshfield in 1887 is a lot of people. I mean, the population was maybe twice, two and a half times that. So people were coming from out of town to attend this event. And while we are on talking about uh, the Catholic cemetery, I wanted to mention this because this, this has been one that always kind of uh, surprised me. Well, I don't know if surprised is the right word, um, interested me. In 1892, Father John Eisen was assigned to St. John's Church as the Catholic priest, the pastor of the church. And he was only here for 15 years, but yet when you go and look at the location of the St. John's Catholic Church, he was responsible for the building of the church building that's there currently in 1893. And then in 1897, he erected the school building, and then he erected the senior high or the, the, the upper class room that same year in behind the building that's there now. So, And then in 1903, the rectory was put up too while he was still the pastor. So he was really responsible for a lot of the building up on that particular piece of property. Before he died, and he knew he was... Um, his health was not good. He, he, his heart was not good. Uh, he placed a crucifix at the cemetery. And the description in the paper talks about it being put at the head, no, at the center of the cemetery. And I always figured, I, I imagine the Catholic cemetery, the original section was uh, the two lots that are down on the bottom. The, the Catholic nuns from the hospital are buried on the right. And then more municipal or public are buried on the left. Then there's a roadway that goes up to the middle. And then there's two more sections behind that. The priests are buried way up behind that other section. And I figured that the crucifix would have been placed probably near the center of the back part of the church, kind of like a church. The crucifix is, fixes at the near the altar. And I would think that this, this would be the same type of setup for the cemetery. But it looks like this picture was taken sometime around 1910. Um, and this just kind of fell in my lap um, six months ago or so. Um, but this is a picture of the crucifix that he put up at the cemetery. The first crucifix was placed in 1901. It had a wooden cross. And in a matter of the four or five years, the base of it was rotting. And so before he died, he had this monument put in with a cast iron cross behind it and then the body of Christ hanging on it. That crucifix stood in the cemetery until 1958. Now, at that time, I was young, but my family would tend to go to the cemetery and visit people after church on Sundays, and I don't remember it. Um, so when I finally found a picture of it, I thought that was pretty cool. 
what, what's interesting is it stayed in that location until 1958. And then in 1958, um, the name of the Catholic cemetery was changed to the Gate of Heaven Cemetery. And at that time, they took the crucifix down that was in the center of the church, uh, center, center of the cemetery and moved it to the front of the cemetery and um, replaced the cross. The cross was, was rusted and shot. They did a complete restoration on the body of Christ, and then they relocated it to the front. This was put in in 1958 and stayed there until sometime in the mid-1980s. We don't have an exact date of when it was moved. I should remember it, and I don't. Uh, it was replaced with the current entrance to the Gate of Heaven Cemetery. And so just as a little sidelight, there was a Catholic priest at the hospital named Father Joseph Jock. He is the individual who's really credited with getting or setting up and saving the hospital. When they had financial problems in the beginning of the hospital time, the sisters were working their tails off trying to, to make ends meet and, and pay mortgages. And he came along and started to help them. He was the one who suggested selling insurance tickets so that they could collect insurance money from people working in the woods and then use that money to pay off their mortgage. And anybody who would have gotten hurt was guaranteed to be taken care of. He worked himself to a frazzle, it was probably the wrong, probably a, a good way of saying it. He, he was the pastor of several parishes in the area and he was working up at the hospital. So he was wearing himself pretty thin. And in 1897, he went back to Europe and received the Knip Vosser cure, you know, the hot and warm blankets and different water treatments. Um, and he brought that back to Marshfield after he recuperated and established it here in the hospital. And between those two things, it really kept the hospital going in the early years. When he died in 1944, his body was brought back to Marshfield. And in this picture, you can see the piata that's at the entrance to the cemetery right now. Um, oh, it didn't do what it was supposed to. Darn, this is where the problem was. Okay. Um, anyway, the crucifix that's out front of the cemetery right now has the piata on it. And in this close-up view of it, you can see the piata here. And if you look over the right shoulder, you'll see a cross and an altar-like structure in the back. That is Father Jock's grave. And the piata was originally placed there by the sisters of the sorrowful mother from the hospital. In the 18, well, in the 19, mid 1980s, Father Lakitas and the sisters made a came to an arrangement where the piata could be moved from there to the entrance, and then the sisters donated it to the Catholic Cemetery Association, and they were to take care of it. Another picture that I would love to have, just just for explanation points is to have a picture of that uh, piata on its original pedestal so where people could see what it looked like all those different years. It looks, it makes a great entrance for our cemetery, um, but it is kind of forgotten that it had a different place in the cemetery at one point. So talking about, that was the sidelight where I said I was gonna get off track. Um, talking about the records of burials here, uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, Hillside Lutheran, the two earliest graves in that cemetery are marked uh, 1879, and there are two of the Lutz kids. Um, I don't know their exact date of death, uh, but I know they both are buried in the cemetery, and the information on their grave markers is 1879. The Catholic Cemetery Association had the earliest death recorded there was 1880, and then in the municipal cemetery, it was 1881. What's interesting is that you have all these people being buried there before you have ownership of the land. So what type of arrangements were made with the Corning family ahead of time that we would feel comfortable burying our dead on that property? I, I mean, if you think about it, um, I wouldn't think about burying my child or my spouse or my parents on land that I didn't know that the, the grave wouldn't be protected forever. And so it's interesting here that the graves, the person, the people are being buried before we have ownership of the land or that we have evidence of ownership of the land. 
So that that was just the one thing there. And then I, I wanted to talk a little bit about cemetery in the news. And this goes back to the ownership and, and things. While we don't see ownership of the paper, ownership papers until later after 1884 and five, people in the newspaper are referring to it as our cemetery. And so somehow there must be some addition or somewhere there must be some additional records. They're just not at the county courthouse uh, that talk about the cemetery transfer of lands. And here they're talking about this one um, in 82, they're talking about clearing the land. And so the idea of what they were doing was going in and clearing the brush and rubbish out of there and getting it ready for burial spots. I think the next one talks about, no, this one talks about roads. There's also reference in several places, uh, several newspaper clippings about the fact that they're using that land and staking it out for cemetery plots. In the 18, late 1880s, a cemetery plot on the hill in the municipal cemetery was uh, $4. It was $6 for an adult and $4 for a child. Um, today they're five or six hundred dollars, if not more, for the same size plot. Anyway, when you go to reading the newspaper, one of the things that the the citizens of Marshfield were complaining about or raising an issue about was the fact that there were no roads up to the cemetery. And when we started, I showed you the map and the fact that that cemetery land was kind of earmarked as a cemetery before they had roads out there. In 1883, they're talking about the need for roads, and, and it wasn't just to the cemetery. It was the road to Hewitt, the road to Richfield, and the road to cemetery. They wanted the roads developed so that it was safer to travel. And in 1884, uh, the city passed an ordinance or work, authorized the work to build the cemetery from B Street, which is Blodgett, out past the cemetery. And it was named the Cemetery Road. Uh, so for the next uh, 30 years, uh, maybe not 30 years, 25 years or so, uh, that road was referred to as Cemetery Road. And so the, the work was completed that year in July of 1884, so there was a road there after that. Now, the fact that it was named Cemetery Road always kind of, um, if you were a uh, hospital administrator, or if you had a hospital uh, across the road from the cemetery, you wouldn't want that street named Cemetery Road. So uh, in 1903, the city, the hospital, and the neighbors on St. Joseph Avenue today petitioned the city to change the name, and they were more than happy to do so. So between 1884 and 1903, so it's 20 years, the road was referred to as Cemetery Road, and then after that, it became St. Joseph Avenue. So, and then there are sections in the cemetery, areas of the cemetery that are special. Um, first one that was established was uh, the Grand Army of the Republic. The Civil War veterans got together and petitioned the city to dedicate a space in the cemetery for the burial of uh, the Civil War soldiers, the guys who fought in the Civil War. Civil War. And so the idea was that the city gave the Grand Army Post, the James Blaine Post, uh, ownership uh, to bury their dead uh, in Section 13, Lot 13, Row F, Section A, at no cost. And so that land became available for veterans to use for the Civil War. And this is a picture of that particular area up there. Uh, it, Memorial Day is coming. It will all be decorated with flags. Uh, and the graves are well maintained. One grave, though, has is, is always been an interesting one. And this, again, is where, where this, this history is buried in the cemetery. Uh, there was a Civil War veteran who was buried in the cemetery uh, before the city actually owned it or the, all the land was surveyed and things. And in 1905, the city cemetery was resurveyed and they found out that Charles Armstrong's body was actually outside of the cemetery. And so they petitioned the city to move the body back into the cemetery. And so his body was moved into the cemetery. There should be a marker for Charles Armstrong. There is no marker for Charles Armstrong. There's a marker for a William Armstrong 
who that may be his grave, but they don't know for sure. Uh, there's no one, no records at that time to say, you know, that that was the burial place of Charles or William, but the marker says William. And one of the things I wanted to do while I showed you this is that uh, in 1911, uh, the, the, the government uh, was giving free headstones to Civil War veterans. So if you had a Civil War veteran in your family and there was no headstone on the grave, you could request a headstone and they would ship it to you and place it on the grave markers. And so this marker may have been placed in 1911, long time after, and somebody just filled in the request form wrong. But one of the things that's important to, when you're looking at the cemetery markers up there, you'll notice most of the white markers that are in the um, soldiers' graves in the, in, the, in the front or the old section of the cemetery have round tops. Uh, this round top for Mr. Armstrong here, that's an indication that it's a Union soldier. Uh, the, 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 the markers that were provided, Union soldiers have a round top and Confederate soldiers have a pointed top. And so if you look at this mark, this is another marker that's in the cemetery. It's for uh, Emil uh, Hager. And Emil has a unique history in that he was first a Confederate soldier. Then, uh, he, I don't know if he was taken prisoner, I can't remember that right now, but he had the opportunity as the war was going on to enlist in a union, uh, un, union outfit. So he served as both a Confederate soldier and a Union soldier, but when his marker was ordered, they ordered the Confederate. So. Uh, that is the only Confederate marker that's up in our cemetery, but it gives you a chance to see the difference of the way they appear. And then there's all sorts of markers up there that, you know, we, we think about the people who are buried there. There's stories with every one of them. And I've just picked out a couple that I wanted to kind of highlight tonight. The first one is a, a gentleman named Lucius Foster. He came to Marshfield in the about 1890 and when he arrived here his intent was always to go back home to where his family lived and over the years he he decided marshall was a pretty good place and so he opted to say well if the family stays here i'll be buried here and so when he died in 1896 the family was planning on staying here and he had accepted the fact that he would be buried here. But just in case, just in case, um, he had himself buried in the first metal casket in Marshfield. It weighed 900 pounds. That Without the body, it weighed 900 pounds. And there were six guys carrying it uh, out of the church, and one of the handles breaks on the side of the, cemetery, uh, of, of the casket because of the weight of it. And quick thinking they didn't drop the casket they managed to save it but the first casket the first metal casket that was buried in marshfield cemetery was actually his and the intent was that if his family left marshfield he wanted to be dug up and taken with them and, and buried wherever the family is buried so today his son um, i don't know if charles is there but i know or and his wife are buried alongside with Mr. Foster, and I believe his wife, Margaret, was buried alongside of him. Uh, one of the things about the records, some records are really good and some records, it sounds like they're supposed to be there. You know, the newspapers indicate they're there, but there's not a record of them being buried there. So if you were to look on the interactive cemetery in Nix or the Marshfield cemeteries, put in the name Foster, you'll see um, Charles or, or listed, his wife listed, and some other Fosters listed, but you don't see Lucius's name and you don't see Margaret's name. And that's the husband and wife. And we know they're buried there. So, and just a little bit more about him. Um, when he and his wife came to Marshfield in 1890, they purchased the Blodgett, well, they purchased what was known as the Tremont House. And they operated as the Tremont House until 1898 when C.E. Blodgett came in and renamed it the Blodgett Hotel. Uh, the Blodgett Hotel was one of the big landmarks on Central Avenue until 
uh, the 19, late mid 1920s when C. E. Blodgett built the Charles Hotel. Then the store was remodeled or the front was remodeled into store space and it probably wasn't as fancy. And then in the 1950s, there was a fire uh, that destroyed a lot of the hotel. Um, but when the Fosters had that hotel, it was the biggest hotel, one of the best hotels in the northern part of the States. And so they had a very successful uh, business. Um, if you want to read more about that, uh, the Marshfield genealogy page has uh, something called QR codes of historical Marshfield, and there's probably 20 or 30 pages of reading material if you go to that site about the Tremont House or the Blodgett Hotel or the buildings or businesses that operated there after that. There's also areas in the cemetery that are referred to as Potter's Field. And if you go to the old section of the cemetery, you know, there'll be a map coming up in here in a minute when we, and I'll show you this, but there's two sections on the immediate uh, fronting St. Joseph Avenue uh, in the old cemetery section, the old municipal section. One is section A and one is section B. And in the northwest corner of section B, about where the crossroad is, the first crossroad, there's a big clear space. That area was established as the potter's field where individuals who didn't have the means to be buried themselves uh, would be buried. And there's some interesting stories about burials that took place in there. One of them, and I think I have a picture here, one of the stories that we included in the Marshfield history book, uh, the first one in 18 or 1987, uh, 1997, uh, mentions an Indian that was uh, killed in the fall of 1879. You know, this is kind of like the Paul Harvey rest of the story. So in 1879, this Indian was in a bar that was run by or a uh, bartender worked there named John Bear. And the Indian came in, he had been drinking whiskey and got drunk and rowdy. And John Bear took a pool cue and hit him over the head with it. And he died. The story goes that uh, the city went to the Indian chief at the time, who was John Young, and said that you have an Indian brave here that needs to be buried. And the chief said, uh, me no kill Indian, you kill Indian, you bury him. And so we did bury him. We put him in a pine box. We wrapped him. Um, they wrapped him in a, uh, in a a blanket of some type and then buried him out on uh, the north side of town. And you got to remember at the time, 1879, the north side of town was Deggie Street. So he was buried alongside Edison. And in 1910 or 12, nope, it's not here, 1910 or 12, they're putting in a basement on Edison Street and they unearth his body. And so they take the body to the mayor and the mayor says, we need to bury him in the cemetery. And so he was one of the first people buried. Well, I won't say first. He was one of the people buried in the Potter's Field section of the cemetery. There's all sorts of little stories like this that you could talk about with the cemetery for a long time. And there's some that are funny. There's some that are sad. Um, but there's all sorts of stories that are tied up with the people that are buried in the cemetery up there. Now, in 1911, they were starting to be concerned about outgrowing the cemetery. And so this is the original cemetery for the municipal cemetery. Section A is on the left, section B is on the right. And the main road or the main entrance to the cemetery used to run between the two. And there's lots of stories in the paper about the hearse getting away from the drivers as they're leaving the cemetery because it goes down this hill and the horses didn't like to have the hearse nudging on their backside. And so the horses would take off. And, and there's one story about um, the hearse getting away and the horses actually ended up on uh, Arnold Street someplace and the driver and the pallbearers that were on the wagon hearse with them um, ended up in the ditch. Uh, the, the, the horses escaped without injuries. Um, one of the drivers had a black and blue spot, but the hearse had a glass plate and the whole glass plate was uh, crashed. So there's stories like that uh, about that. 
at some point, uh, and I don't think I have this in here, at some point, the hospital decided to level out the hill on St. Joseph Avenue. They spent $200 to bring the grade down so that it wasn't as steep in front of the hospital. And when they did that, it made the grade coming out of the cemetery steeper. And so they blocked that off. And today we use the entrance between the Catholic Cemetery and the Municipal Century Cemetery as the main entrance. And when you look at a picture, you'll see uh, a metal railing, kind of like you see at a bridge or on the side of a deep uh, ravine along the highway, kind of blocking the main entrance. So in 1911, they wanted to expand the cemetery. They wanted to make it so that it was bigger and it would last longer for burial of Marshfield's dead. And so they purchased five acres west of the cemetery. And at that time, they start thinking about what can we do to make it um, more appealing, more more of a more a better atmosphere for the burials. And so they actually came up with a, a, a very nice plan for the new cemetery. And in the time when they were doing that, they thought our cemetery needs to have a name other than municipal cemetery. And so they had people sending suggestions to the Marshfield Times, the paper at the time, uh, and a name was selected. And the big, big buildup. We're going to announce it November 1st. And so what they came up with was this, this plan. And what they did was they added one, two, three, four, five different sections behind the original two. And the round rings there are supposed to be large fountains that they planned on putting in. And then the best burial spots were going to be in between the two fountains. Today, that's the roadway that's next to the storage shed, the uh, storage and tool house. And the other sections are pretty much set up the way those maps look today, a uh, map looks there. So we have section C, section D, section E has no burials in it, section F and section G. And that was the first addition to the old cemetery. And it was at that time that the cemetery, the municipal cemetery, uh, was given the name Hillside Cemetery. Uh, Hillside Municipal Cemetery is one name. And then the uh, Lutheran Church also adopted the Hillside name for it. So it became the Hillside Lutheran Cemetery. And the Catholics did um, kept their the Catholic cemetery name until, like I said, 1958. All right. Now, at the time that they were um, doing all this remodeling, they wanted to erect a couple other things. Uh, one of the things was they would hold annual Memorial Day services at the cemetery, Decoration Day services, and they wanted to have a bandstand up there or a speaker stand. And so in 1912, they erected uh, what they would describe as a strong, substantial structure and a great improvement over the old stand. We don't have a picture of either the old stand or the new stand. And it, it, if it was built in 1912, cameras were readily available. There should be a photograph out there. So again, that's one of the pictures that the Northwood County Historical Society would really like to have. If somebody had a picture of what those bandstands looked like or those speaker stands, it would be nice to have a chance to make copies of them. And how long they would have lasted, um, it, it depends. You know, wood wasn't treated at that time, so it might have only lasted 10 years or something. But at least we know that there was this, this stand there that we don't have photographs of. And then this is the main entrance to the cemetery, and this is in between section A and section B, and you can see the, 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 the upward slope there. And as I mentioned, as horses were coming down pulling carriages, uh, it got kind of steep toward the end, and uh, that caused some problems. And now there's a, a barricade at the end of that. Um, what they planned on doing with this is that pathway would actually continue forward. Uh, and where you see the fountains, the round rings again, they would have been straight ahead of you there. Uh, the fountains were put in. Felkers actually uh, created the 
fountains out of galvanized metal and put them in. Uh, I'm not sure how many long years they were used. There's mention of them being placed in the in the cemetery, but there's no mention of them being taken out or used after that. So they, they appear once, and I think at some point they must have decided that that wasn't necessary. And then when they put in the storage house uh, in 1914 and restrooms, uh, this was that area where that elite section or that best section of burial spots were supposed to be located. So we have an, an, a nice little storage shop, uh, storage shop or building for the section and the equipment that's used for caring for the cemetery there. There's no evidence there today of this bandstand and whether it, uh, it was supposed to have been uh, one end will be so arranged to provide a speaker stand. So there should have been a, a speaker stand on the end of that. In the left-hand side of the top picture, you can just see uh, remnants or the piece of the old Hanson Chapel that was taken down a couple years ago. Um, it was a beautiful structure, but once it got moisture in it, it just didn't have the air circulation to uh, survive and it was taken down. The first mausoleum at the cemetery was put in in 1914. Um, W.D. Connor and his wife, Mame, uh, had, a, had a number of kids, but their oldest son, Donald, was killed in a car accident in, I think it was 1912. And... Um, he was buried in the cemetery, and then his parents had the uh, mausoleum put up immediately after that. It was finished in 19, well, it, the body was exhumed and put into the mausoleum in 1914. Um, that was completed by a company from New York, and it cost about $10,000. Um, it's interesting when you look at some of these, how much it cost. I'm sure you couldn't replace that today for $10,000, but some of the markers or are, are cemetery stones in the cemetery, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 that they were spending on some of them. And there's some beautiful monuments in the cemetery. Every year, um, the, the Marshfield Historic Preservation Planning Month or committee uh, gets together and arranges to have historical reenactments at the cemetery. And this is that idea of the cemetery coming to life. Coming to life. Uh, in this picture, we have Greg, Greg Jack, and he's uh, been our, our Sergeant Willard Purdy for 20-some years now. Uh, he's the only guy in town that fits in that uniform. <laughs> and he does a good job portraying uh Willard Purdy. But what we try to do is we have um, people from the community portray some of the people who are buried in the cemetery and tell their stories. In this case, uh, Sergeant Willard Purdy is sitting right, his, his marker is right in front of that cluster of kids with the purple shirt, the green shirt, and the orange striped shirt. That's Sergeant Purdy's burial spot. And then in the background is a flag that was raised in 1922 um, as a marker for the Flanders Field area. We usually have the kids, if there's time, walk over and look at the marker. There's about 40 names of Marshfield, people who served with the Marshfield unit who were killed during World War I on there. And so we use Sergeant Purdy to kind of talk a little bit about the history of the war effort and, and the loss of Sergeant Purdy, but it's also a reminder of the others that died in that war. And then we hit other spots. Uh, we try to spread it out across the cemetery without having uh, to have the kids walk too far because if you spend too much time walking, they don't get back to school in time. And so we have individuals portraying Governor Upham. Um, Everybody's probably familiar with Governor Upham's name. His wife, Mary, is portrayed. Uh, they were really important to the early history of Marshfield. Uh, we have Gabriel Dolph Lupient portrayed by someone. He was the uh, hired man that came with the rivers to Marshfield in 1872. Uh, when it comes to who are being portrayed, the one caveat is we need to have a spot in the cemetery where they are, can be associated with. And so we always try to have uh, someone 
the people that are, are being portrayed are people that are actually buried in the cemetery. We tried doing Louis Rivers once because we were requested to have uh, Louis Rivers portrayed, but it's kind of awkward when you not he's not really buried there. And so we stopped that. Each of these people have a different story. Um, my wife is in the front in the upper right picture. She plays um, Mrs. Um, John, John um, Berg's wife, a blacksmith. And she was the woman who sewed the first American flag for a parade in Marshfield. Behind her is Jean Swenson, who portrays um, Geraldine Smith, um, Clara Arian Thomas, Geraldine Smith's grandmother. Uh, at the time of the Marshfield fire in 1887, she was 12 years old, and she talks about her experiences that day. Uh, in the back row there is Bernie Bining. He was a fireman, and we had him portray Otto Sharman that year. Some years we have different people being portrayed, you know, and we'll bring this one in and that one out uh, and stuff. Then standing in front of uh, Otto and behind Sergeant Purdy is Tammy Jackin, who portrays uh, Anna Lathrop, the first woman in Marshfield to be elected as a city council member in 1923. 1921, she received nine write-in votes for Alderman of the Fifth Ward. And then two years later, she officially put her name on the list and won her first term. So the reason I wanted to show you this slide here is because I wanted to invite everybody who's here and everybody who's listening, or if anybody who's watching this, uh, to come to the public tours on Friday, uh, Memorial Day, uh, it's going to be May 26th this year. They start at about 9 in the morning, go to 11.30. We take a short break and then start back up about, depending on when the kids are coming from the schools, it could be anywhere from 12 to 12.30. Uh, but what we do is go then until about 2.30 in the afternoon. And you're more than welcome to just tag along. I promise you that it's fun. Uh, one of my favorite memories of these cemetery tours is uh, Mrs. Uh, Helen Laird, David Laird's wife, uh, was portraying Mame Connor, and she had uh, a, a very nice dress on, and one of the little girls raised up her hand and said, is that the dress you died in? And <laughs> they, I mean, the kids really get into it, and so they're a lot of fun, and uh, if you have time, come on up and join us. So, and with that, I think I will take questions. Marshfield has a very peaceful looking cemetery. I think we should be very proud of it. So, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Yeah. Um, when I was setting up the chairs and everything in the room, there was a college student working in here and she was just leaving. And she said, Well, what is the presentation tonight? And I told her. And she said, Oh, you know, when I was in third grade, um, I used to come on these cemetery tours. So these people remember them. Yep. And my kids all remember them. They speak so highly of that. It's such a way for kids to learn just being immersed in it like that. So I think that's just wonderful. Yes. So we have a good time doing it. Pray for no rain. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Anything else? There's no other questions here. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I thank everybody for their attention. Thank you for joining us. And uh, if you have questions, just stop at the Northwood County Historical Society anytime, and we'll be glad to try to answer them. I just have a couple of things to say. Oh, okay. You want me to move? Oh.